Well, once again, it's a huge honor and privilege to speak to all you great people here at the Hills Campus, and I'm also speaking to everyone online who is joining us, but also people in Shanghai. And uh, how cool that we get to speak to people in Shanghai in China, and uh, another place, Hobart. Who would have thought? Just got a mention. And also Brisbane Central. So come on, guys, give them a clap. Really appreciate people joining us. I was, um, I'm excited for Summerfest. I won't be there, but I'm excited for it. The running club put me off. Now, I was actually invited to speak at Summerfest because one of the things that you're going to study is spiritual disciplines and the importance of those things. But the reason that I can't come is because I'm speaking at the Summerfest in Melbourne or Geelong. So I thought what I'd do tonight is to speak on what I would have spoken on at Summerfest. Is that okay? At the beginning of the year, if you were here in the last couple of weeks, and especially if you were here this morning, you would have heard that at the beginning of this year, we are posing the question, who are we becoming? Or more specifically, who are you becoming? And for the first couple of months of this year, different speakers in different venues around Australia are going to concentrate on your personal devotions, your spiritual disciplines, with the question in mind, who are you becoming? And if you weren't here this morning, you need to get hold of that message that Hayden Nelson brought when he spoke on, we are becoming the person we are. And it was a brilliant message, and this message will lead on from that. Later in the semester, or the series of messages, we're going to look at who we, as a community, are becoming. So we're going to look at what it is to be part of a redemptive community. So we're going to concentrate first on you as individuals, then we're going to look at us as a community. And I'm really looking forward to the next few months. Does that make sense? Yeah. So with that in mind, we're going to get into this message. Father God, thank you very much for these wonderful people here at Hills, Shanghai, Hobart, Brisbane Central, anyone joining us online. I pray that this won't be just another Sunday night message. It won't be just another message, another sermon, but I pray that this would be a significant moment in people's lives, a turning point, a point where people in all the different venues and in this one make decisions about the rest of their lives. I pray that you'd speak through me in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Every single one of us, whatever our situation or circumstance, has some sort of aspiration. We want to become something. Sometimes we want to become successful. Sometimes we want to become rich. Sometimes we just want to become clever. Sometimes we want all three of those things. But we all have an aspiration. And when we're young, we look up to people. We want to become perhaps a top sports person or a famous singer. Or when you're little, a superhero. But can I just say that 
We've got to be careful about what we want. Because sometimes those things happen. Many years ago, one of my cousins saw my three children behaving well, which was encouraging. They were very little, and they were being good that day. And they said, how can I, how can my children be as good as your children? What do you do? So I said, well, I've got a goal that my children are good, not clever. I want them to be good. Because if they're good, they're more likely to work hard at school and release their potential. They're more likely to go to work, get a better job, and make some money. So my goal is that they are good. She looked at me as though I had rocks in my head. She said, I don't want my children to be good. I want them to be rich. It was quite a shocking statement. Tragically, as life went on, it became a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. So whatever your aspirations are, check them out. Because they could come true. In the 1950s, I wanted to be a farmer. Specifically, I wanted to drive tractors. When I played with tractors, I'm dreaming of my future. I think you should put that back up again because that was, it disappeared. There I am. Of course, it's in black and white because no such thing as color photography <laughs> in those days. That was me. Yes. I had a toy tractor. There it is, trying. Not plastic in those days. Look, I'm even dreaming of riding a real tractor. There I am. So I had a, an aspiration, a dream. I wanted to become a farmer and drive a tractor. But the real reason I wanted to become a far farmer and drive a tractor was because my dad was a farmer and he drove a tractor. Here he is. That's my dad back in the 50s. I wanted to be like him. We heard a great series of messages yesterday in Sergius Memorial. And one of Sergius' sons talked about the fact that he wasn't like his dad, but he was like his dad. There are certain stages in our life where we don't want to be like our dad, but actually deep down inside, we really want to be like our dad, assuming, like Serge, our dad was good. And my dad was good. And I wanted to be like him. Now, maybe you've had a terrible experience. But we're talking about wanting to be like people we admire. May not be literally your dad, as it was for me. But who is it that you want to be like? In 1974, I became a Christian and I discovered that I didn't just have a natural dad. I had a heavenly dad. I had a father in heaven who was real, present, good, generous, loving, caring. And as I read the Bible, I began to get to know the attributes and the characteristics of my dad in 
heaven. And I wanted to be like him. So what was it about him that I discovered? What was it that he wanted me to become? What characteristic did he have that he wanted to share with me? It's one of those characteristics that I want to talk about tonight. And I suspect it's not one that you immediately thought about. One Peter chapter one and verse 14. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Holiness is one of the attributes of God. As ignorant and disobedient and often godless children, it's a very difficult concept to grasp. God wants us to be holy. And if we are obedient children, as it says here, we should want to become holy. So what's your aspiration? My aspiration is to become holy. If you want a title to this message, it's called, I want to become like my dad. This verse that Peter is quoting, be holy as I am holy, is taken from the book of Leviticus. Now, if there's one attribute that postmoderns don't tend to talk about, it's holiness. And there's, if there's one book that they don't want to read, it's Leviticus. So I thought I'd read Leviticus and speak about holiness. Let me tell you a story to give you context. A friend of mine, back in the 70s, had an aspiration, a dream, to be a brilliant, successful, and wealthy business person. That was his dream. But it became a self-fulfilling prophecy. He became su successful, excellent at his job, and wealthy. But at the cost of his marriage and at the cost of his parenting and at the cost of his health. He became an alcoholic because he had the wrong aspirations. He would drink at least one bottle of spirits every day. One day he's in his living room and Jesus Christ appeared to him in a vision. And he fell on his knees in the middle of his living room and he gave his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. The encounter was so transformative that without any counseling, Without any instruction, he walked straight to his drinks cabinet and he poured every bottle of spirits down the sink and he was instantly and miraculously set free from alcoholism. That night, he went to bed bemused, uncertain as to what had taken place, but if you 
or in this auditorium or in Shanghai or in Brisbane Central or online or in Hobart, you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants to come into your living room and he wants to have an encounter with you that will change you forever. That night, he was woken up in the middle of the night by an audible voice speaking to him. Just said one word, Leviticus. Of course, he was a godless businessman. He'd never heard of Leviticus, so he went back to sleep again. Second time in the middle of the night, Leviticus. Third time, when God speaks to you three times audibly in the middle of the night, my recommendation, take him seriously. He had a friend who had given him a Bible. So even without prompting, when he got up in the morning, he picked up his Bible and he flicked through the contents page and he came across the third book in the Bible, Leviticus. Never heard of it before never read his Bible before, started to read Leviticus. It is the one book I would never recommend to a new Christian. But reading that book changed his life. I said to him afterwards, what was it about that book that spoke to you? And he said, I cannot tell you. Leviticus is not about irrelevant sacrifices or obsolete food laws. Leviticus is about holiness. And God, his father, who had sent his son, Jesus, to my friend's living room, wanted his son, his new son in the faith, to be holy. So he spoke to him about Leviticus. It wouldn't do any of you any harm to have a read. I'm going to read you three verses from Leviticus. Leviticus 11.44, I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves and be holy because I am holy. Do not make yourself unclean by any creature that moves along the ground. I am the Lord who brought you out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore, Be holy as I am holy. Leviticus 19 verse 1, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say to them, be holy. I, the Lord your God, am holy. Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 26, you are to be holy to me because I, the Lord, am holy and I have set you apart from the nations to be my own. Holiness is about giving your life wholly to God, being set apart, not being conformed to the pattern of this world, not living like your godless friends, being different forever. There's nothing wrong with being a car salesman which is what my friend was. But after having an encounter with the Lord Jesus, he gave his life to him forever. Handed his life over and said, whatever you want me to do, do it. He went on to become a missionary, happily married, serving God, set apart for him with a new aspiration not to be wealthy, successful, but to be holy. Can I suggest on this Sunday night in Hobart or Brisbane or here at Hills, can I suggest that if you want an aspiration, not just for 2024, but for your life, make a decision. I want to be like my dad. I want to be holy. There's two things 
that you need to understand first before I talk about some of the theory and the practice of holiness. Firstly, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 10 says, and by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. In other words, you are already holy. Because of Jesus and what he accomplished on the cross, if you put your faith in Christ and ask for his forgiveness, God has made you holy. You wouldn't be able to approach God were you not holy. He is so holy, so glorious, so awe-inspiring. Inspiring. The Bible says he lives in unapproachable light. And yet, because of Jesus, we can walk into his presence with confidence. Not because we're good, not because we're nice, but because of Jesus. We have been made holy. But a couple of verses later in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 14, by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. This is what the Bible teaches. We are holy and we are being made holy. It is both an accomplished fact and a process. I am holy, but I'm becoming holy. I am holy, otherwise I couldn't enter the presence of God and I'm being made holy, otherwise I wouldn't be able to fulfill the requirements of God. That's two things that you need to be, understand. He tells you who you are and then he tells you who you are to become. So in the first scripture he says, you're my children, now I want you to become like me. I want you to grow up and become who you are. You are holy and you are being made holy. If you think that's a contradiction, theologically, it's called an antinomy where two seemingly opposing truths are held in tension. Just like Jesus is both fully God and fully man, and he is completely sovereign, and he has given us free will, you are holy, but not yet. Righteous, but not yet. Saved, but not yet. Healed, but not yet. You've got the kingdom, but not yet. So I am holy, that's why I can put my hands in the air and worship the holy God, but I have an aspiration to be like my dad. I want to be better. You get in the idea? Hayden talked about it this morning, but the Bible is divided into theory and practice. And the book of Ephesians is a perfect example. The first three chapters talk about who you are, your identity, and the second three chapters talk about how you should live. The first three chapters tell you you are holy, and the second three chapters tell you how to live a holy life. There's uh, the second book that you should read after tonight. So start with Leviticus, move on to Ephesians. So Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to God's holy people in Ephesus. That's who you are. But then Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. You are light, now live as children of light. It's interesting, if you ask a postmodernist who God is or what God is like, 
They always say 99% of the students will reply, God is love. On John chapter 4, but 1 John chapter 1, three chapters previously in the same book, first says, God is light. And anyone who says they are without sin calls God a liar. Before you can fully grasp how loving God is to forgive you, you need to grasp how appallingly filthy you are. He is light. You and I were darkness. But because of Jesus, we have become light. And now we are light. We need to live like light. Now we are holy. We need to live holy. Now we are righteous. We need to live righteously. Three things in Ephesians chapter one, and I'm not gonna go through it in any detail, three things that we need to grasp. This is the theory, if you will. Number one, we are chosen by the Father to be holy. Ephesians 1, 4, he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy. You think it's all about you. It's got very little to do with you. God has a plan and a purpose that started a long time before you were born and is gonna finish a long time after you die. And he chose you to be holy so that you can bring praise to him. It's not about just having a great life. You don't come to Jesus and be happy. You come to Jesus and be holy. He chose you to be holy. Second principle, we are redeemed by the Son and made holy. Ephesians 1, 7, in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of His grace, which He lavished on us. So He has chosen you to be holy. And then through Jesus, He has made you holy. And then because we are being made holy, number three, we are marked by the Spirit to make us holy. One, Ephesians 1.3, and you were also included in Christ when he heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with the seal, with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is deposit guaranteeing our inheritance in the future until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So let me highlight what Ephesians 1 says, we are chosen by the Father to be holy for the praise of His glory. We are included and redeemed by the Son to make us holy for the praise of His glory. And we are marked by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit who on a daily basis is making us holy so that He can present us glorious before the holy God in heaven. It's not about getting a good job, finding a partner, buying a house if you can afford it, and living a happy life. It's about, I want to be like my dad. I want to be like my dad. He's chosen me to be holy, and he's redeemed me to be holy. And he sent his companion, the Holy Spirit, to be with me, to make me holy. This should be my aspiration. This should be my goal. You get the idea? Now, when Jesus was on this earth, he said, if you want to know what the Father is like, look at me. He is the embodiment of God. God in flesh, God incarnate. Philip asked him one day, show us the Father. And he said, don't you know me? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. I'm revealing the Father to you. You wanna know what God's like? 
is like me. The son embodied his father. So he was as loving as his father and as holy as his father. Never sinned, unlike us. But on this earth, he showed us not only the pattern of what God is like, he showed us how to be made holy. Can I just take a couple of more minutes and tell you how to do this? Is this helpful? I guarantee you, when you came tonight, you didn't think you were going to be talked about Leviticus and holiness. All right, number one. These are three practical guidelines that Jesus did and I do every day. These are my spiritual disciplines around holiness. Is this okay? Number one, Jesus prayed to his holy Father. John 17, 11, I remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world. He's praying for us, incidentally. And I'm coming to you, Holy Father. Holy Father. Here's Jesus talking to his Holy Father. And then when his disciples came to him and said, how should we pray? He said, this is how you should pray. Our Father, holy is your name. Hallowed be your name. He doesn't say, this is how you pray. Our Father in heaven, you are nice. (laughs) He doesn't say, you are loving. He is nice, not as you understand it. And he is loving. But when Jesus said, if you want to be like me, pray like me. Pray to your holy Father. Holy is your name. When Isaiah saw God in Isaiah chapter 6, he fell to the ground. He heard the seraphim and the angels and the glorious beings in heaven crying out in a loud voice, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And Isaiah fell on his face and says, woe to me. I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips and I have seen the Lord. Every now and again, we need to have a bit of a glimpse of what it's really like in heaven. This is how you pray. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. I don't know about you, but what I do every morning, I pray the Lord's Prayer, but I don't say, oh Lord, oh Father in heaven, holy is your name, because I want it to be real and I want it to get into my spirit. I say, our Father in heaven, holy, holy, holy is your name. Holy is your name. What about this one? Number two, Jesus knew the Holy Scriptures. He knew the Holy Scriptures. Matthew 22, verse 29, Jesus replied, you are in error because you don't know the Scriptures or the power of God. When Paul talked to Timothy, he said, as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learnt it and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Notice, you are saved, but you are being saved through a relationship with the Holy Father and a reading and a memorising of the holy scriptures. Psalm 119 verses nine says, how can a young man keep his way pure by guarding it according to your word? And then verse 11, I have laid up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I wouldn't dare go a day without reading the Bible. Because how can I be like my dad 
when Jesus says that you must know the Scriptures. When Satan appeared to Jesus in the wilderness, Jesus didn't say, it's okay, I went to Bible college. (laughs) He didn't say, I went to church on a Sunday night and I know all the words to relentless. (laughs) He didn't say any of that. Satan is not convinced by your genius or your academia or your so-called religious devotions. He's not interested in how long or how short you prayed. What he wants to know is, do you believe in God and His Word? Jesus shows us what to do when we are tempted. Satan will come to you and tempt you in the area of pornography and drugs and sleeping around. He will tell you to get drunk like your friends. He will tell you to lie to your employer and curse like your friends. So what are you gonna do? Say, I read a good book this morning. No, you're going to say, away from me, Satan, for it is written. And then you better know what is written. That's why when I became a Christian, they said, don't just read the Bible, memorize it. So that when you're in a dark place, and you will be, when Satan comes to you and there is no one else to protect you, you can stand on God's word and say, I pray to my holy father and I know the holy scriptures and I will not get drunk. I will not sleep around. I will not get addicted to whatever it is you're tempting me to get addicted to. Jesus prayed to the holy father, knew the holy scriptures and was empowered, number three, by the Holy Spirit. Acts 10, 38, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. If Jesus needed the Holy Spirit, you and I need the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19 says, don't you know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? So don't join yourself to a prostitute. The Bible doesn't mince its words. Don't join you. Don't you realize that God Himself has come to dwell in your mortal body and He's holy? And think, it doesn't just happen when you're young. Just a couple of years ago, I was in Sweden, walked into a lift, and two beautiful young women walked in and said, We'd like you to come to bed with us. What do I do? No. I was slightly shocked in my 60s. (laughs) But my body belongs to God. That's why I'm careful about what I eat. That's why I'm careful about what I do. Because it goes on to say, God has bought your body with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. But here's another thought, Ephesians 4.30, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with every other form of malice. I'm constantly reminding myself, I pray the Lord's Prayer, I quote the Scriptures, and then every morning I remind myself, who the Holy Spirit is. And I go through the fruit of the Spirit. A a normal prayer will go something like this. May the God of love, may the Spirit of love be shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Spirit. Romans 5.5. May the joy of the Lord 
be my strength. Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 10. May the peace of God guard my heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 7. May the patience of God help me to wait for the Lord and his harvest. James chapter 5. May the kindness of God lead me to prayer and repentance. Romans chapter 2. May the goodness of the Lord follow me all the days of my life. Psalm 23. May the faithfulness of God provide a way of escape when I'm tempted. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And grace when I fail. 1 John 1, 9. May the gentleness of God help me find rest in you, Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28. And may the self-control of God help me to endure and lead me ultimately to the feet of Jesus, Matthew chapter 8. Every morning, I remind myself. So when I'm driving down the road and someone cuts me off and I wind down the window and I want to swear at them and I... (laughs) The Holy Spirit within me says, hold on, I'm your companion. You talked about what I'm like this morning. Truth is, I'm still not a farmer. I don't drive a tractor. I'm not as courageous as my father, my natural father. But as I get older, I'm getting a little more like him. He had great faith. He used to get up in church and read the scriptures each week. And as I get older, I'm not like my heavenly father at all. But I am by the grace of God being made more holy. What's your aspiration? Amen. Just before I hand back to Lexi and the team, can I just ask a question? I said, God has chosen you. Whether you feel like it or not, he has chosen you. But in order for you to have a relationship with him, You need to be forgiven. That's why he sent Jesus. To clean you up and make you presentable to God. That's the first step. And the reason that he does that is because we're a mess. And it may be that you're in this auditorium or in Brisbane Central or Hobart or Shanghai or online and you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ like my friend did in the living room. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. But first, he wants to forgive you. And in order for you to be forgiven, you need to ask him to forgive you, but also ask him to be Lord of your life. That will be the first step of an amazing journey where you go on this journey with God as your Father and the Holy Spirit as your companion. If you've never done that, I'd love to invite you to pray with me. Perhaps everybody could close your eyes eyes and uh, bow your heads. If you've never given your life to Jesus or you haven't followed him for a long time and you need to get back to him, I'd love you. Just make a decision. I'm not even going to ask you to put your hands in the air. I'm just going to ask you to decide in your heart, I want to follow Jesus. And we're all going to pray this prayer right across the link. We're going to pray this prayer. And I want you to join with me. And if this is the first time you've prayed this prayer, this could be a turning point in your life. So let's all pray this prayer together. Oh God, my Father, I want to be like you. So please, change me. 
do what I cannot do. Today, I invite Jesus Christ to be in my life, to forgive me and turn my life around. From today, I put him in charge. He's now my king, my Lord, my savior. And with your grace, and with the help of your Holy Spirit, I intend to go on a journey to become like my dad. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Wonderful. Give these people a clap. If you did, pray that prayer. Either for the first time or for the first time in a long time, when you tell someone straight away what you've done, walk into the fire outside, people are holding these Bibles, and walk up boldly and say, I prayed that prayer. I want to follow Jesus. And we would love to give you a gift. I um, took a little longer than I intended, but it's summer camp. Give me a wave if you want to become like your dad in heaven. Amen. God bless you.